Indeed. I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Lindy Zeiss Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome to Hi, Arcane everybody. Mark. Welcome to Arcane Mark. Today we're talking about off the charts monsters. So, you know, in Pathfinder 2, compared to many other editions of like kind of rules heavy DD esque systems, Pathfinder 2's building creatures rules, I feel are a reliable and trustworthy source and i'm totally biased because logan and i wrote these rules but Bias you know what reaction. i've written other building creatures rules for other editions of things for paizo that i don't feel were as trustworthy as these building creatures rules yes. that i wrote well i mean i can certainly see they're so the much easier to work with and they're so much easier to check and see you know like is this creature balanced is this creature fair you know, not needing to do the the kinds of design where it's like, well, this is how many hit dice or this thing this has, and therefore, but instead being able to look at things holistically is uh, really really helps and makes development uh, and design a lot faster. Uh, and Scott says it's off the charts if it can't have graphics. But um, yep. yes. Uh, but when it comes to uh, monsters in um, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you have the, uh, the Game Mastery Guide's uh, guidelines for how to build them and how to balance the different factors, like your, right. like your offense and your defense and all those kinds of things and the sorts of considerations that you're, you're looking at. If you're making something that's on the charts, that's usually not too bad. Now, you could still make mistakes such as building too strictly to the charts and not realizing that your monster can make like three attacks with no multiple attack penalties so maybe its damage should be lower i've talked about this before in previous mm -hmm. episodes that's a whole different story when you're sort of trying to be on the charts but then you realize it shouldn't be quite as much on the charts yeah. and i will point out also that there are some things that are on the charts that you know you that like still feel a little off but that you still use like there are times when you're going to want to use those extreme values for things and those low values for things based on how you're pulling things together and the game mastery guy has a lot of great guidance for like for example if you have a rogue that's do a type creature that's doing sneak attack then having them do extreme damage when they're doing their sneak attack type thing is appropriate or if, if they have like moderate a, accuracy if they yeah. have moderate accuracy yeah so like that's when you have these counterbalances coming into play then there are cases where things are appropriate to be uh, to be using some of those more extreme values, either literally extreme or low. I would argue that the extreme and terrible values are on the charts. Yes. A, because there are guidance that say use the extreme mm -hmm. value when you're using the moderate accuracy, and B, because there's a chart with a column that says extreme, and it yes. is on that chart. So, yes. So, uh, so, I know. They're literally on the charts, but I wanted to address that first. So, like, what happens then when you when you go Sorry, beyond I, that? Yes. It was a little too funny for me th th this evening. Yes. <laughs> That's totally cool, honey. Uh, but, but yeah. So, when you're, when you're going off the charts, then you have creatures that are doing things that are just, like, vastly more hit points than normal. I have twice the moderate number of hit points, for example. Yes. There are monsters that have twice the moderate number of hit points. Now look, when you're looking at hit points, there are not that many values that you're even suggested to use that are on the charts. There's mo there's moderate values for hit points. There's high. Mm -hmm. There's not even an extreme. There's yes. moderate, there's high, and there's low. Okay, And the high value for hit points, it's not that much higher than the moderate value. It usually is about 20 five percent higher at most than the moderate value for hit points and and often it is like i think less than 25 percent higher yeah so when you're talking about egregiously high hit points you're talking about a creature that has egregiously bad defenses in some other way it maybe is around 25 percent but mm -hmm. Having double as many hit points, that's not even close to being on the charts. So when you look at things like, say, a Pathfinder 2nd Edition Ooze, which has an AC that is basically like, hi, I am hit. Yes. Their AC is complete trash. It's so far below terrible in many cases. Uh, it usually is something where it's like, a negative five for dexterity plus like maybe their uh their 10 plus their level plus two so it'll wind up with like a 10th level ooze that has an ac of um like 17 yeah at level 10 when the the lowest um terrible ac is on the charts 
at level 10 is 27. Yeah. So it's 10 lower, the one that I just suggested that many users at level 10 might have. It does consider the extreme value is 33, which is six higher than the, lo the low yes. value. And I have just said that it would probably have one that's 10 lower than the low value. It is more off the charts than the entire size of the charts. That's correct. It goes so low. But then Uzas also have an interesting way of interacting with critical hits. Where they don't take double damage from them. Yes. So between the fact that you don't take double damage from the crits and that your armor class is very low, that means that every attack is going to hit probably, mm -hmm. even your final attack. But you have twice as many hit points and you're not taking double from them, even though you may mm -hmm. hit by 10. So you might, you might think initially like, okay, well, you know, if... They, if the, if you're hitting, if you're usually critting when you would be hitting, then that's like twice as much damage, right? So why do they have twice as many hit points if they have like the critical thing? But that's also because with an ooze, and this is part of the reason why it's interesting to have these kinds of things that break the mold, is an ooze changes his strategy. Even a character who almost never uses their, you know, uses strike three times in a round because they say, well, that their third one's not going to hit, you know. I'm only use it if there's literally nothing else I can do. Like against an ooze, it can still be very worthwhile to make that to make that third strike because it's suddenly an interesting yeah. and different puzzle. Here's why it's a different puzzle. Linda's right. It could be worthwhile to make your third attack against the ooze. It actually will probably hit. But guess what? Moving is also very useful against the ooze because, because they're probably not very they're fast. slow. They may have to use a lot of actions to catch up to you. your one move. Maybe faster than even two moves of the ooze, maybe now they can just not even attack you because yeah. your stride was more than double the ooze's stride. So there's multiple strategies you have that are excellent against the ooze, but the ooze is probably got super high hit points and super good offense. So if you just, you can go up and just smack it. You'll do a lot of damage, but it's mm -hmm. going to wreck you So because you have other ways of, of dealing with that ooze. And yeah. that's the thing. An off the charts monster gives you a chance to make a puzzle that is slightly different in combat. Now, if your players aren't ready for it, they couldn't be in big trouble. Like the blood ooze in uh, Fall of Plague Stone, that is an, it's an early adventure, the first adventure ever published for uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And groups that didn't know it's an ooze, what do you do with oozes, sometimes got killed by that thing. Whereas other groups just didn't get hurt at all because it was very slow and very easy to use the action economy against it. But if you play it like, I'm just going to run up and smack it, it was mm -hmm. very dangerous too. Especially if you uh, hypothetically run up and smack an ooze that splits into many other oozes that then surround you. Yes. Hypothetically. <laughs> that's a different situation. Yes. But that's not about being off the charts. But, that yeah. wasn't off, about off the charts. That was just a, a interesting strategy that was almost a great strategy, but it was actually a terrible strategy that we've we've mentioned before mm -hmm. in our uh, War for the Crown streams. But that it was the after the play test when I killed Luis's fighter, I've never killed anyone in Pathfinder Second Edition. Mm -hmm. But I, the closest I came was Linda's fighter, and if I yes. hadn't given her a hero point for accepting the heroically foolish plan <laughs> of being at ground zero while they split the ooze into like 16 pieces, each then of which is a full it. offense, and then fireballed it. With her in the middle of the fireball, then she would have died. But that, honestly, if anything deserves a hero point, that does. I'm just bad at assigning them. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very clear that she earned a hero point, which she immediately we needed used to not die. To not die. Yes. Absolutely 100%. So another example of these off the charts monsters that I like to think about is the comparison between uh, the conspiracy between like skeletons and zombies mm -hmm. and the pair that those two make where you have the where you have the zombies that are like hit point bags, but also piles of weakness. That's right. I think zombies maybe, maybe. Are they technically are, still on the chart by a little bit? They may barely be on the chart, but skeletons are off the charts. They have an off the charts high resistance to certain types of damage that is just not even allowed at their level normally. Mm -hmm. But they still have. Whereas I'd have to look at, even though I wrote these two monsters and I wanted to showcase what Pathfinder 2 could do with the differences between these two. I wrote them initially in like a super alpha and they kind of stay pretty similar. I feel like zombies either broke the chart or were very Let close. Let me see. They've also got really bad AC, too. They totally do. But I thought that they may have had... Uh, they have got low AC. And uh, so they are 
on the chart They're for that. Okay, is it on the chart for hit points? I think they may have high hit points. No, 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 that's right. They are off the chart. The ch- I knew that I they might have been off the charts for that. I remember, right. yes. I remember when balancing zombies, like looking oh, wait, no. at other zombies. With right, examples. no, they are on the charts for hit points because of their weaknesses. Ah, uh, yes, yes, that's right. They are. They they are with their because weaknesses. they have extraordinarily in, high weakness. In fact, they yes. arguably don't get as much as some other monsters do for their weakness because level negative ones can be one shot in any way, so they don't get as many hit points as uh, building creatures tells you to give something for mm-hmm. having two. Five value, off, but their weaknesses are off the charts. High weaknesses, yes. so that is something else that's off the charts. So they actually do have something that's off the charts. Is how high their weakness is, and it makes you feel like a god darn hero when, when you, you slash them and you're just doing ridiculous damage. amounts like, of damage. Yeah, my little cleric did a two with my scimitar. It's like two. How about take seven damage? Yeah, it's like whoa! I did so much damage. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Well, they I see skeletons and zombies in the early game as sort of like a teaching tool about resistances and weaknesses. And that's why their resistances and weaknesses are the only part of them that is literally off the chart. Yes. Now, are they both very extreme on the chart in, in other ways? They are. They are like the extreme ends of the chart and they're away from each other. But their resistances and weaknesses are off the chart high. Normally, you shouldn't put resistances and weaknesses that are that high on a level mm-hmm. minus one unless you know what you're doing and you intentionally are doing that for a very specific reason but if you are looking to do something like that zombies and skeletons are a great place to look for a general balance point on that and one of the nice things about them too is that there's a variety of zombies and skeletons at different levels so they can give you good examples of where to go for that's that. true i believe that only the level minus one ones are fully off the chart it's possible there's some other ones at like level zero or one, mm-hmm. but they quickly go onto the chart. Like they don't remain as having higher weakness and resistance mm-hmm. than their level for for too long. Yeah, but there's still a good example for of like high resistance slash weakness. Oh yeah, absolutely. That you can take a look at for comparison. They Definitely one that I phase over from being off the charts as a teaching tool at the beginning to mm-hmm. going on the charts, and you can watch as they make that progression to see when and why they are off the charts. Mm-hmm. And I think that's another thing to think about, too, for, like, when you have creatures at level negative one, sometimes things will go off the charts just because it's really hard for them not to. That's Like, if you have a level negative one creature and you've given them a weapon that deals D8 damage, then suddenly, like... Here's another secret for you. Let's say I have a level negative one creature. I'm trying to follow the charts. It told me I'm supposed to have plus three in my high stat. (laughs) <laughs> to be honest, some things want to have plus four in their high stat, which is like, there is no extreme value listed mm-hmm. there. But, you know, sometimes I do that. That's a little off the chart, but whatever. But no, I did plus three. Mm-hmm. Now, all I've done is I've chosen that that plus three is in strength. Yes. Guess what? You're off the charts. Yes, exactly. Because even if you give them a dagger. E- even if you give them the D4 a dagger, weapon. then that's going to do five and a half damage and extreme damage is four. For being um, on the charts there. Or four and a half, as the case may be. So you're one damage above extreme for a level minus one if you even just give them strength as their high stat. Yes. That's just it. You can't avoid it. I mean, it's not much off the charts. It's probably Mm -hmm. okay-ish, but think about the fact that it's very swingy. You'll definitely want the damage to be, or sorry, the accuracy to be, to be quite low. Quite lower than and you, you really it. want a monster this level minus one, where the idea is that they miss most of the time, and then so when usually, they do hit, they yeah. possibly want. So usually, your what I do with those is I'm like, all right, you know what? They may, when they're a level negative one, they don't get to have that plus three strength. Their strength may be more like plus two, or maybe you know. Or their dex is high. That's why a lot of high, level minus ones are little critters. Little, little with critters, with dex. and then they have higher dex, and then you don't have to worry about the the damage bonus as much because that lets you keep accuracy being solid and because especially because like with minus ones if you're seeing them you know the sort of the classic four level nine negative one creatures that are together fighting against a a level one party like you you do want them to be able to to hit sometimes but you don't want them to be like either nothing or like oh my gosh it's a devastating blow and plus if you know, if they do roll that nat 20 and crit, like, you don't want it to be really messy. So that's another... Speaking of which, zombies are actually also off the charts for damage. Mm -hmm. Their damage is very high, but with their very low number of actions, it's almost your own fault if you let them get to you. Yes. Because they're slow on their movement speed, and they only have two... I mean, they're not that slow. They're 25. 
but yeah, but having they only have two slow, actions. Yeah. So if you start your turn at least with a 30-foot gap between you and a zombie, you're not being attacked by that zombie. Yes. It's just not going to occur. So that's a very powerful counterbalancing factor. If it's, like, permanently slowed, like, that is a huge debuff to offense. Yes. And you'll also see things, like, to, to continue talking about undead um, and things in the other direction for, like, for what about, like, super high defense? Um, incorporeality. It resists so many damage types that they often have very low hit points mm -hmm. as a result. Yeah. So when you especially at low levels, like you want to not do incorporeals at low levels, mm -hmm. and if you do, you may want to give them an escape clause like the shadow that takes damage from spells from the light weapons of the light spell on them, just so that there's something you can do if you didn't have a magic weapon and you fought it and you were level one. Yeah, or sort of the classic, you got a magic weapon or something like that before going into this area. But even then, well, there's most also of your the classic, the like um, the classic Jason Bowman chuckle, which is in Pathfinder First <laughs> oh God, Edition, yeah. Crypt of the Everflame. There's a room with a shadow in it that back then they were immune to non magical weapons. Mm -hmm. And hidden in the room, if you spend a few minutes searching for it, is a plus one dagger. So it's like, if you only had time to find it without being killed by the shadow, you would have this magic weapon that could fight the shadow. But you can't. Yes. So, die. So the other <laughs> one, the other one that behaves like incorporeality are other things that give resistance to, like, resistance all physical. Or resistance or most physical, all. Resistance all. Or like, hardness, for example, is a really nasty resistance. So you'll sometimes see that with, like, creatures with construct armor is something that I find really interesting, where... They have this ability where, you know, they've got this hardness and they've got this AC and they've got all these defenses, but then there's a way to smack through those defenses. And once you do, their defenses are low. Yes. Maybe not, they don't necessarily I all mean, the way go they down. They usually go below. Mo below, mo they usually go to like more like moderate. Moderate or worse. But not necessarily like capital and L And they low, lose but... all the hardness. Yes. And... But whereas the hardness has already been paid for in their hit points. So yes. then you have a thing where it's like you gotta crack through the shell to make it. I remember it. when we were playtesting my playtest players, that was the thing that they liked the most. They fought construct armor, they were like, that was so cool because it was really annoying. And then we cracked the armor and it was easier to fight them and this and this the state changed, the phase changed, they liked. That's not even about being off the charts because usually they're on the charts in both directions. Yeah. They just move to a different place in the charts, but it's still an example of playing with the charts a little bit. Yeah. And I think some, well, one thing I've noticed is that some of those go off the charts in how much hardness they have. Although, although, uh, what, what I have found, uh, what I found as an adventure developer is that, um, uh, people prefer those when they stay more on the charts because especially at the lower levels, if you have hardness that is so high that like PCs might not be able to get through it at all, then they can, well, then you gave a problem. really good point. Some, not because Concert Armor forces you to, but unfortunately for like, unfortunate very similar to the reasons mm -hmm. some of those low level animated objects were forced to have a higher hardness because it was like well stone always has this hardness or iron always has this hardness They're like oh but that's off the charts for hardness and so uh i've noticed that organized play is often we have our like, animated leather armor with the we yes, use all the time it's a it's very like animated armor the to animated have foam stone statue where the the stone is made out of foam i don't think something. we've ever used foam i mean it really, wasn't yeah. called foam but like it just yeah. had lower hardness and it's like a, like a cracked animated statue yeah, there or you something go. like that that we've done yeah we it do those kinds like of things stone, but it's not as hard as stone. animated sandstone statue sandstone or whatever we do. yeah but we, we've done things like it's that it's much before, more so. fair in, in a lot of cases so, so i would recommend so, not going off the charts yeah. even though you may see examples don't do that the best year he gave you an example of a bad case of going off the charts where you do it for verisimilitude instead of because you had a very good reason to go off the charts. yeah i think that like if those things were higher level by default then it would have worked but then there's the problem also, is like, that you wouldn't say that like a little broom or a like some yeah, of these things just like a, a suit of armor that came to life has to be a super high level monster like it was like who would win between a basic suit of armor an empty suit of armor that was brought to life or like an uh that like a human knight-sized suit of armor brought to life or mm -hmm. or an ogre yeah. Like, I think an ogre should, should probably win, yeah. win that because it's much bigger than the suit of armor and the suit of armor doesn't even have a person in it. Yeah, but that's tricky. So, but I think yeah. that, like, especially when you're coming with stuff your, yourself and you don't have the, like, those, like, we need to have an animated suit of metal armor. 
Like, there's more flexibility when you're not specifically trying to fill one cut of niche to be like, let's come up with something that fits things better. Like the animated leather armor, for example. That Should it one of questions, table. one ogre-sized duck or 200, or 100 duck-sized ogres? Um, I think the action economy is going to give the duck-sized ogres the advantage. That's true. And and considering Warlock said the same thing about because, the action economy. Because the 100 duck-sized ogres, they're going to be critting every round. Yeah, they're going to have five crits unless the ogre size... And I don't know what duck stats are, but if duck yeah. doesn't have an AoE, then I think the ogres are going to make it. Even though they don't have any good reactions or other type mm -hmm. of actions, just from crit fishing against the duck. Yeah, because think about it. Like, if we assume... Even if the, even if the ogre-sized duck was able to defeat three duck sized ogres every round then like it's gonna take a really long time to chew through that many so yeah yeah i think that the the, the 100 is just too many duck -sized yeah unless ogres. you give the ogre sized duck like some kind of a giant sweeping attack or something like that it's possible that the, also that the duck sized ogres oh there's also can the duck fly down attack and then yeah. fly back up again okay well that's if a the, good point yeah and also the duck sized ogres may not work together very well because they're ogres and yeah. so this could be an issue so now that's a, it's a very good question. A question for the ages about duck-sized mm -hmm. ogres and ogre -sized ogre -sized ducks. ducks yeah. So there's other ways that you could think of going off the charts. I'm going to say this right now, which is if your monster is not like a spellcaster or gimmick monster that is supposed to do spells or some weird thing like turn you to stone, you do not want to be off the charts down on like damage slash accuracy ever. Mm-hmm. I don't care what your reason is. I don't care. Uh, okay, I'm sure you can come up with a parodical excuse. Like, I have a one-action thing that makes 50 attacks with no map on the same target. And my damage is below um, the low damage, but isn't that okay? And isn't it still overpowered? Mark said never put it below. Yeah, it's like, yes, okay, yes, sure. Yes, because you gave it a one-action attack, attack yeah. that gave you 50 attacks with no map. But in any reasonable, reasonable case where you didn't do some outlandish mm -hmm. action, yeah, there's virtually no reason that you would want to be down off the charts on accuracy or damage yeah. for a creature that is supposed to hit with those attacks yeah so when you so like for example when you mentioned spellcasters having a spellcaster that doesn't really have a decent melee attack when it's like okay yeah sure they have a staff but they're this they have a staff just because that's what their art looks like they're not actually attacking with that staff they'd much rather use their cantrips and other things and stuff like that but then you're not but then you know, you consider that in the way you build things, and you're not going to be like, oh, yes, I'm going to give them a fancy, like, plus two great to striking staff. It's like, yeah, whatever. They have a plus one staff. They could bonk you with a fit if they want to, but that's not what they do. Yeah. And you know what? Um, Exune Willow says has some cultists performing a ritual who are basically just, oh, you should rewrite them as a complex hazard. Just rewrite your, his encounter. Look. Mm -hmm. I remember one thing when I was doing a design pass on Fistful of Flowers, the development lead, um, James Jacobs, was saying to me that the he wanted me to look at the hazard that was actually deer, but it was a hazard. <laughs> and he also said that he wanted me to take a look at it, but that also that like it changed the way that he was thinking about hazards because Linda and Eleanor, and I think that section was you, Linda, yeah, that like was... put that in there. And it was like, oh yeah, it technically is a creature, but the creature is interacting mm -hmm. as a hazard in this case. Yeah. So you it's, absolutely it's interesting. Can do that. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like how. What is the predominant way that you're taking this thing down? Are you taking it? Is the expected way more like with skill checks or with damage? If the expected way is more with skill checks, even if damage is a possibility, then it is more like a hazard. Yeah. So, like, there are cases where something that seems like an off the charts monster should probably be a hazard. A kaiju is a good example. They're just yeah. so powerful compared to any. PC and they're so big on, on the map. I mean, yes, there have been PF1 versions that are like, ah, oh, theoretically, this 1,000 foot tall thing is just being in a six by six space on the grid and we're uh, hand wavy. Mm -hmm. But like, they should be so big that the, they just are the grid. And yeah, you, they and are the they're map. They're like yeah. this whole map and they're doing, or the, you're just in the city and figuring out what the aftermath is. And that's why they work great as complex hazards that you just have to survive and deal with. Mm -hmm. As opposed to like, yeah, no, I'm fighting this thing because I am the same size compared to this kaiju as like a flea is it's compared, compared to, to me. me. Yes, exactly. Yep. So like, 
that's an example of something that has off the charts size that may just have been off the charts in many ways if it was created mm -hmm. as a creature. And that's another thing too, like if you want your thing to have a gazillion hardness, doing that through a way of making it a complex hazard instead, where the disabling is the way you're expected to get around it instead of hit points, because hazards are allowed to have way higher hardness since that's not the expected solution. Encounters are kind of like a puzzle uh, mm -hmm. that have different solutions. And we talked about oozes and zombies. The solution may involve backing off because they can't get to you as easily. But sometimes you think the solution to anything is a ha is a hammer and everything looks like a nail. And that can be true if you have a big enough hammer. But it can be more fun if you have to try to use different tools. Know your group because your group may not be sort of capable of using different tools. And, and that is off the charts monsters may not be right for them. Yes. You may want to stay more on the charts in that case. Whereas if your group likes being creative, or at least after getting their butt kicked a little bit by it and backing up, then they enjoy coming back and being creative after they learn about the differences. Off the charts monsters can be exactly what you need for that. By just, But you need to make sure that they take into account that they're off the charts. You can't just put something off the charts and be like, ah, it'll be fine. Because it probably won't be fine unless you mm -hmm. take it, uh, care of it. And Rico solves all the problems with the meteor hammer. Yeah, I want to go back to another thing that you were mentioning about, like if it has some ability that's like, oh, I just turn you to stone and things like that. Like when you're thinking about the DCs for your abilities, then uh, then that then that's a consideration too. Like that generally, the nastier the ability is, the or the more that it's going to mess you up, the more you might want to consider taking that DC down. And if or you, make it gradual. Or make it gradual because if you because a lot of times if you're like the only way I feel like I can compensate for this ability is by knocking something all the way up a chart, then maybe maybe asking can I make something that is thematically similar to this idea, but isn't quite so punchy. So I don't feel like this is something that's outside of the weight class. Cause once again, the the it's very swingy. If the monster is like, well, the only thing mm -hmm. I can do is that I might turn you to stone and it's a 20% chance that I turn you to stone and 80% chance that I don't. Yeah. And then on that 80%, then you're temporarily immune and I can't really do anything cause my offense is off the charts low. So that's the end. And mm -hmm. you had five people, and yeah. I turned one of them to stone. So do I slowly the other four, make people clumsy? And, and if gonna, they keep failing their saves, then dead. they become, or then they then they turn into stone. Do I do something where slow instead of clumsy? Slow, or do I do I do something where like do I do something where like you know if they there's you know a certain number of stages, and you go down two stages if you critically fail, and one if you fail, and then you and then you get to that point. So that it's not like instantaneous, but it's much more likely that something will happen. Yes. But if you're thinking, I'll just make it a really terrible condition and it'll be off the charts low DC mm -hmm. that's below the lowest, don't. Yeah. There's a reason why the tables, you may have wondered, be like, why do some of the tables have different values than others in the Building Monsters Guide? And if you look at the tables, the spell DC and spell attack bonus, which is also used for ability DC, mm -hmm. only has a high and a moderate and an extreme. And extreme, yeah. Do you know why it doesn't have a low? It's because if you were considering putting a low, it even says it in there, then it shouldn't have that spell or ability in the first place. If, if yeah. it's something where it's like, well, it's so powerful that it has to be low because um, if it hits, it's just they're wrecked. It's like, why are you doing this? Because, because that point, then there, only there's a small like chance a, they're wrecked and then there's a large chance that it doesn't do anything. It probably only has like a 5% chance for them to fail. Mm -hmm. at that point or 10 percent at a low unless it was like the big boss in which case does the big boss want to take an action that okay maybe it has a 20 percent chance to work yeah right it's like no no you don't want to do this mm -hmm. it should have things that if it's their special ability or spell that it's good at or yes. at least moderate at so um that is one reason not to go off the mm -hmm. charts on yeah i tend to i tend to look DCs. for i tend to look for this but for the abilities like when i go with the lower dcs it tends to be like this is something that has a really big area so they're likely to affect a lot of people with it and then and that even would, then you're going with the moderate DC. yeah and even then i'm going with the moderate dc i'm not i'm not going to go below moderate but then or an like, automatic yeah, aura would be automatic moderate. aura or things like that yeah where it's like this is a pretty nasty large nastily large aoe or an aura or like something that like a lot of people are going to get hit by, so this is going to have an impact because, you know, maybe you don't want, maybe you want to have, like, fewer people overall failing it, but people are going to see it. So, you might be tempted to put a DC that's above extreme, that's off the charts. Here's my take. 
don't. Mm -hmm. Instead, if you're like, no, but listen. Okay, Mark, listen, this is the one time. Because my ability doesn't even do that much damage. And then they'll often just critically fail, take double, but it's still not that much. Have the damage then and lower mm -hmm. the DC. Or sorry, not have. Double, uh, the double, double, double the damage and lower mm -hmm. the DC. Because your players, if you tell your players that they're taking 66 damage and they critically failed and it doubled, they're going to be more demoralized than if they were taking 12 D6 damage and they failed and it was full. Yes. Because it's just demoralizing, especially if they got, if they were like, okay, you roll your saving throw. Oh, yeah, okay, you really well. I got a natural 17. It's like, okay, wizard, though, you're a wizard. I know, but I took 16 in my dexterity, so it's still pretty good. It's a, this result, and you're like, okay, mm -hmm. critical fail. What? And they're like, what? Yeah. That was a natural 17. And you're like, yeah, critical fail. And then you're like, critical fail, and you take 20 damage. And they're not going to be paying attention to the 20 damage and the fact that their wizard they're gonna actually... They're going to be like, oh my gosh, That their wizard has actually has, let's say, 150 hit points. So the 20 damage on the critical fail was like nothing. Yeah. They, like, you all lost them failed, at the yeah. part that they critically failed on the 17. And they're going to be like, what even is this? We shouldn't be yeah. fighting this. So that, so that's, uh, yeah, so that sounds more like, okay, the thing that you had happening, exactly. That, to shift everything over by one so that what you want to be the thing that probably happens is... Yeah, thing. exactly. You want what you the most likely outcomes should be the ones that you set for the so success. So let's say that was at level eleven, and the extreme DC is thirty four, mm -hmm. and I was making it thirty seven. Yeah. No, I can just make it twenty seven and mm -hmm. set, shift all the degrees of success by one, and twenty seven is the moderate DC. Yeah. So it's better because the players will feel like they succeeded by more if you do it the second way, even though it's literally very, very similar. So I don't suggest going off the charts on DCs in either direction in almost any case. And if you're like, but it's a gimmick and I need this monster to like teleport the PCs for as part of the story. So I'm giving it above DC. You can just like make it be a higher level monster to teleport stuff. It doesn't have to be the appropriate level. If you absolutely mm -hmm. need it to happen and be like, yeah, this they're level five. This was a level 20 monster. And it did it. So then and that like way that they won't be like, how did that critically fail? I rolled an 18 and they're like, well, I'll just tell you it was a level well, 20, 20 monster. monster. And, and it's like, like oh, okay, okay. yeah. Well, Whereas if go. you're like, well, it was a level 7 monster, but it happened to have a DC 40. Yes. And you're like, what? Making it a higher level what? monster or like making it some kind of like a ritual activation or something like yes. that. That's, that's different from like a thing that this creature can just always do. Because... You know, it's good for players to be able to get a sense of like what can monsters of their level general of the level that they fight generally do because then you have that sense of progression as you get stronger and they get stronger and you get to see how it works. That's right. So you could consider giving a monster an off the charts really low or high saving throw that's above extreme or below terrible just to encourage people to learn about the monster and not go off against its strength or to mm -hmm. exploit its very low weakness. I think this is one of the cases where it could work. Uh, yeah, especially, but you're going to want to pair that up, too. Uh, so, like, if something, if you give something an egregiously high saving throw, you're going to want them to have a very low one. Yes. If you give them a really low one, you're going to want that a really high one. Like, if you have a creature that's, like, I, uh, that's basically immobile and it has a terrible, terrible reflex save, but is incredibly durable and has a high fortitude, for example, very high fortitude, then it's like, okay, yeah. So I think that when you when you go off the charts in that way, it should be something that, like, makes sense to the players. There should be, like, something about the creature that's like, okay, yeah, I can see why. That's right. So here's another interesting thing, right? When you're going by the actual recipes that it tells you to use, a soldier <laughs> is high attack and high damage, and the brute is moderate attack and extreme damage. Yes. Right? There's also a thing you can do that's not recommended to do extreme attack on moderate damage, and you can. It's not more, I guess it's not anti recommended, it's just not one of the default recipes. Mm -hmm. It's totally fine. You can do it. It's People will feel like they're being critted a lot. Yeah. So it's not as great. And you want to be careful in particular about that at the lower levels because the crits Absolutely. are more devastating at but that point. But the damage yeah. isn't, isn't quite as bad. Now, there's one more thing you could do that's off the charts. You can do this. Um, you could do ex uh, above extreme accuracy with low damage, uh, but you want to you want to be careful with that mm -hmm. because here's the thing: 
Extreme accuracy is already at like very high levels, almost 10 higher than low accuracy. And extreme damage is about double low damage. So 10 is a full degree of success. Yeah. It's going to more than double your damage to get plus 10 accuracy because it turns a zero damage miss into a hit and it turns a hit into a double damage crit. So already in some cases, extreme accuracy might warrant more like low than moderate damage yeah and so going above extreme accuracy can be dangerous can then you go to damage. even lower than low damage probably at that you point. might yeah. need to which is very weird and if you go below low accuracy or something like that like low accuracy even regular low accuracy would need above extreme damage mm -hmm. and it's also again one of those very swingy things where it's like I've created a monster that will probably miss with its first attack. It will de pretty much definitely miss with anything else. Mm -hmm. But if it hits, it's devastating. it hits like a truck. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but why do you want that? Yeah. So there's only a few times that you would want to go off. You would time. be, that would be something where, yeah. And crits, the people, there's a mention also, crits also interact with dying in a very different Completely way. Yeah, so that's, true. that makes it much Completely more dangerous with that true. one. So you might want to consider, you might want to consider like if the idea is like this creature is super duper accurate. You might want to consider something that's sort of like, you know, the, the swashbuckler ability where it's like, even if you miss on this type of thing, you still do a bit of damage. Yes. So that it's like, that feels really accurate without like getting into the whole, oh, now we're critting all Or a meta strike like some classes have where it's like a two action, you give mm -hmm. yourself a circumstance bonus on the attack roll or something like that. And sure, yeah, with that it adds up, but then you're not going to make three attacks, three attacks with that very like, high okay, accuracy. Okay, yeah, now we've, we've charged this up. It's like the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's ways to go off the charts and design monsters that don't follow them. But as we've seen, for many of the statistics involving offense, mm -hmm. you probably don't want to. It's defenses, skills, where you can go off the charts, just be like, yeah, whatever. A lot of the NPCs are just like, this judge, they're, the amount that they're good at judging things is way higher than yeah. their combat level. Just be careful about those skills if those skills have a combat use. Yes, especially if you then use them as a combat threat and they have a... It's like, this person is a coercive lawyer who's a prosecutor who makes innocent people um, admit their guilt because they mm -hmm. claim that they're going to come after their family and do something worse they to them. They have ridiculous and so extreme plus plus this, intimidation. This person has, and it even says, you know, because of this coercive lawyer being used in the highest court cases, mm -hmm. their 15th level challenge in the courtroom, but they're only a third level challenge in a fight. Yes. And they happen to have scared to death. I don't know why. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and it's be like, oh, well, this is a problem because I put it in as a level three fight and it killed all my PCs with scared to death. Yeah. Okay. Maybe that's an exaggeration because they wouldn't have scared to death. Because they're not. Yeah. yeah. Even so, so, if they can demoralize you and give you every, frightened to guaranteed, then that maybe to like almost any party, it may be mm -hmm. above a level three challenge if you use them as a backup character to like another monster where it's like, yeah, this person's turn is three intimidates that all frighten two. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll roll because on a natural one, I may only frighten one because it'll turn my critical success into a success. Yeah. And so like if you were to do something like that, right, you may want to like I could see a situation where you'd use something like that. But then when you're considering what is the challenge of that encounter, they're worth an outsized amount of budget for your encounter. And you wouldn't yes. want to just be like, oh, yeah, well. What they're really fighting is a level 10 thing. And so level 3 is just doesn't even register on the chart and doesn't do things. Like, you almost... I, I mean, like, I'm going to say hazard again. But, like, I could almost see dealing with them more like a hazard of, like, the terrifying... Terrifying prosecutor Terrifying hazard. prosecutor hazard. And you have to, like, try to convince them away. Or, like, and maybe that one... And maybe they have, Use like... legal lore to give yes, an objection. To give an objection or whatever. So you can handle that differently. I mean, I tend to... My mind, when I see something and I'm like, oh my gosh, this just doesn't really work very well as a creature is, does it work better? Is A, can I change the ability to do something that still fits in the theme? And B, can I make it into a complex hazard? That's right. But skills, hit points, AC saves defenses, mm -hmm. resistances and weaknesses. Those are all things that can go off the yes. charts very easily. And one other thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to be like... Uh, well, I'm going to have obscene defenses and then my attacks are going to be terrible or yes. my attacks are going to be ridiculous and or my defenses are going to be We've mentioned this yeah. 
every time. It's whether you're on the charts or off the, the charts. charts. In fact, I put it in the building monsters guide. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure. Yes. The adamantine cobra from PF1 is the perfect crystallization of a bad monster. Where it did this trade-off and it is so boring. Because a monster that just can't do anything useful but you can't get rid of it is a slow, dragging, boring fight where mm-hmm. nothing interesting happens. The outcome is predetermined and it just takes forever to get through and you're like, why did I even fight this? Yeah, and then on the opposite side, if you have the mega glass cannon that's crushed in one hit, but it's like, well, does it does it do anything or does it do something ridiculous and then you squash it immediately? It's still better than the adamantine cobra because there's at least some tension. Mm-hmm. That when it, it leaps out, it does a jump scare of like, oh my gosh, I recognize this. This is a, um, a porcelain cannon. Um, it's an animated object that does mm-hmm. um, 1D810 uh, yes. due to a Sarkeesian rifle error. <laughs> Um, but it only has five hit points. We yeah. better kill it before it gets a turn. Yeah, now to point out, that second category, the the super, the ultra glass cannon that does a ton of damage can work in some other games. Like in video games where if it kills you and you just load from a save point and you're like, okay, this is a gimmick that I have to go around and dodge and things like that. But that's a game with save points. You know, that's not a tabletop RPG. I'm just going to point out that when Joe ran as written the one D eight hundred ten Sarcasian rival, he rolled on the D eight hundred ten like ten or something like yeah, that. Yeah, didn't nobody ki- knew it. It didn't knock out the soldier or whoever mm-hmm. he was shooting, and he was flabbergasted that he didn't <laughs> knock out the soldier while running as written in the Dell. Yes, the he he, he went and he run it again, and then like he zapped someone for a bajillion the yeah, next yeah. time. Yeah, he I think totally so. did. Yeah, but the first time the he first did time it, I was like, what? And it was just the funniest thing because. D eight hundred ten actually gave like a normal like kind of not ridiculous result. There's a comment there that example is also interesting for like the four E mook rolls. Uh, which example? Uh, I think I think uh, something that hits hard and goes down. A oh yes. Hit. So the four E mook rolls had their issues, and uh, but they weren't trying to be something that hits ridiculously hard and trade it off for going down in one hit. Mm-hmm. They had the going down in one hit as a just like. To reduce complexity, we go down in one hit, and we hit, like, okay for our level, but not great. Yeah. But we're not worth that much XP. Yeah, so they're not like, oh, I'm going to hit harder than a normal boss would, and then I'm going to go down in one hit. So it's yes. kind of a different niche, but it's not one that is as well supported by the, the structure. They were also very weird because they always survived things that did, like, half on a miss, even out to an infinite number of those. Mm-hmm. But if they were hit, they would be killed no matter what. So, uh... Yeah, they weren't like a glass cannon that did tons of damage with low hit points, but instead were a like, we're not even worth that much XP. We do almost as much damage, but we're killed immediately if we can get hit. Yeah, and that's an interesting way to like, to to build encounters. Yeah, it it definitely, it has its issues. And if you're not 100% gamist, it really has its issues because of the fact that like, you can just go in and kill them with one hit. And this mm-hmm. type of creature now lives in your world that can be killed with one hit, even 5% mm-hmm. of the time by much lower level yeah. characters. I'm someone who likes to have like a, a consistent world where things work. Like, you know, if a thing works in a certain way, that's how it's going to work. And Rico's talking about like in the PF2 version where you use the exact same monster. Yeah, like if you fight an orc and it's a boss and then later you fight an orc and it's a minion that's not, or not minion, that's another name, but it's like one of the, the baseline like support troops that's not very powerful it's like the same one because then you can see the way that your character grows over time yeah absolutely so these are all ways to go off the charts and i think that one thing that rico was getting at is that the fact that hit points are one of the ways to go off the charts the Mm -hmm. most easily in either direction is also why the 4e minion rules while they had their issues were not degenerate and they did work for 4e even yeah They had some things they were bad at. They had some things they were good at. But you weren't going to make a rule like that that was like going up on damage or down on damage. Where it's like the minion rules are that they have as many hit points as a regular monster, but their damage is always one, no matter how high their level is. Yeah, no, you would definitely not do that. That takes so much table time. Whereas the minion rules was as extreme as possible in the down direction for hit points. And Mm -hmm. it still was not non-functional. And that's because hit points are one of the ways you can go off the charts most easily. Because they are basically a progress bar for the fight. Compared to every other statistic, Mm -hmm. they are perhaps the most off the chartsable. 
And that's why our first example is oozes, which had yes. double. All righty. I, so I think that's, that's uh, what we got. So shall we say goodbye so to YouTube? So let's say goodbye to YouTube and then do our poll. Bye, YouTube. See you next time. Bye.